Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to our monthly Wisconsin Bankers Association Compliance Corner. Scott and I are here once again to walk you through a few things that we believe should be on your radar list, uh, both as far as proposals and final items that were released here this month of October. So with that, we'll jump into our agenda for this particular video. And lo and behold, happy Halloween. It's happy uh Pumpkin day here in a couple of days time. So we want to add in a little clip art for you. Uh, but we have here our usual agenda lineup. And uh, in this month's lineup, we're going to talk about the final CRA rule from a very high level. Scott's going to provide us an overview of the section 1033 proposal that also was recently relis relis released. We have uh, FinCent alerts. We have some items issued by the Bureau that we're going to cover. Um, also, a representment guidance issued by the Federal Reserve. And then at the very end, two consumer items that we believe would be helpful for your marketing area to know about as you're doing any type of consumer outreach on the topic of free credit reports and deposit insurance awareness. So with that, we're going to jump into what we want to cover in more detail in our particular video. And this one, as the slide says, hot off the press, we have our CRA final rule. And um, I think we've been feeling a marathon on this one. Many of you have been working on this for many a year uh, with Scott through a number of different versions of proposals. And now, lo and behold, on Tuesday, um, the agencies issued a joint final CRA rule. I think we're stuck with this one. I don't think there's going to be a repeal of it uh, once again. And so we'll need to work through what these new terms and new thresholds are. So issued on Tuesday, and we have some new bank asset size, which are used then to determine what types of um, performance tests will be made available uh, to you. So we have here on this slide what those new asset levels are, large bank being at least $2 billion, intermediate bank. Uh, at least 600 million to 2 billion, small bank being assets of less than 600 million. I've also included for you the limited purpose bank threshold definition, um, just so that you know that there's a definition out there. So what does this mean? If you go to the next slide, you'll find that we have a whole number of um, tests now that are going to be applied to the various banks based upon your asset level. I won't read them all to you, but there's seven there for you to pick from. And if you are an institution that is defined as a large bank based upon your assets, you're looking to be performed, uh, evaluated against four performance tests, that being the retail lending, retail services and products, community development and financing, and the community development services tests, as those tests are defined underneath the final rule. If you happen to be an immediate, uh, intermediate bank, um, you are going to be evaluated underneath the retail lending test. And then the option of either the current community development test or the new community development financing test. That will be your option. The current community development test is called the intermediate bank community development test in the final rule. So don't get confused. It's the new name, same community development test. Then if you happen to be a small bank, then what you're going to be evaluated under for CRA purposes will be the current small bank test or the retail lending test at your option. The small bank test has been renamed in the final rule as the small bank lending test, just FYI. Um, your bank operating subsidiaries, that performance could be included or will be included in your performance evaluation. The bank's affiliates at your option, that activity will be incorporated into the bank's performance, again, at your option. So for each of the performance tests that the banks are going to be um, evaluated against, the regulators will assign a conclusion. Those conclusions will be wrapped together to have then a final CRA rating. For those banks that have more than one performance test, the performance test conclusions are going to be weighted, a percentage. And what that specific percentage would be for each bank is going to be based upon your asset size. And that's further lined out in the rule itself. So lots of averages here, lots of different weightings going on for these different tests. Um, when is the rule going to be effective? It will be published in the Federal Register. It'll have an effective date of April 1st. 
That does not mean that all of these rules um, apply, meaning that you're collecting data right on that April 1st date. Uh, what it does mean is the new terms apply and the new thresholds will apply going forward. And so the majority of the provisions are going to be applicable January of 2026 and the data reporting then January of 2027. So we have a little bit of time. Most certainly, uh, Scott and myself, education team, communications team will be getting more resources out for all of you, including nitty gritty um, uh, background information pieces of what the tests mean and what their definitions are. We'll work through all that with you, but just wanted to at least let you know that the rule is out there and that we've um, got some definitions to work with and, and some new tests to try to reconcile with what we're currently doing. So that's the nutshell on CRA. Stay tuned. Uh, we'll keep you posted. More to come. 1,500 pages to read. Lucky us. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott because he has a few more pages to talk about in the reading. Yes. Uh, thank you, Heather. Um, because just in case with everything else going on, you had forgotten about uh, consumer rights uh, to access data. Uh, we have CFPB issuing its proposal to implement Section 1033 of the Consumer Financial Protection Act. So, as Heather said, uh, quite a few more pages to read here. This one is, of course, a proposal. So we're in the comment stage. Um, the opportunity to comment on uh, this, which relates to data rights again, and of course, uh, access to consumer financial data. So comments are due on December 29th. Uh, WPA will be submitting comments and we're creating a working group for this one as well. Uh, so reach out to us at WBA Legal uh, if you're interested in being a part of that. Um, that could be you know, sharing your thoughts on the proposal for formulation of WBA's comments, uh, but also uh, so that you can gather some information to potentially submit your own comments as well from your own perspective. Uh, the industry has also requested an extension. Uh, so around time of recording of this video, the comment period is still December 29th, uh, but we uh, have also requested that extension on the time period. What this rule requires uh, is that data providers need to make certain data available to the consumer and those that the consumer might authorize uh, upon request. So third parties that the consumer might be working with uh, for additional accounts or services to have access to, for example, transaction history um, in order to get additional services and authorize them to have access to that. It also provides some standards and formats for that data uh, and applies to cover data providers. So it applies to those who have access and who control that data that the customer, it's their data that they want access to. Key part being that data is, uh, again, cover data meaning consumer financial product or service. There are uh, certain exclusions that apply, but that's going to be the general definition. We'll talk about that uh, on another slide in a moment. So first on the second slide, we have a summary of all the requirements here. There are seven new information collection requirements CFPB has proposed, and we're not gonna go into detail on them, but just wanted to touch on each one really quick to give you an idea of this rule. Um, the main first one here, and this is the fundamental aspect of it. This is the fundamental component of the rule that being a requirement to make covered data available. That's the whole purpose of the rule. Again, to the consumer and to the authorized third parties upon request of the consumer and potentially upon request of the third party who's been authorized by the consumer. That again applies to covered consumer financial products or services at important definition and includes a requirement to have a consumer interface and a developer interface, uh, which is discussed more within a section of the rule. There's also a requirement to make information about the data provider. So in theory, you, the data the, who has control of the data available to the public. So including name, contact information, and so forth. Um, there's a requirement to establish reasonable written policies and procedures. Um, the rule, of course, doesn't provide the exact procedures because it's going to depend on what is appropriate from data uh, provider to those who are holding it, depending on the type of data, type of consumer uh, relationships, the type of accounts. But it does have standards and objectives that can be achieved. Um, so you can look at those when writing those policies. Uh, there is third party authorization and disclosures. Uh, so this would be a request by a third party who is receiving the data on behalf of the consumer. And what you'll see is the rule has a whole subpart for these third party sections of it. And what what this one has is a procedure to be followed 
uh, when the third party makes that request. Uh, that includes a disclosure to be made, consent to be obtained, all from the consumer by the third party. There's also obligations placed upon the third party. And so the rule does limit the collection to the scope of that consumer request. So the need of the third party to fulfill whatever the purpose it is to obtain it, going back to the original um, reason that the customer uh, authorized the third party to do it. So again, the rule does narrow it to that scope. Uh, and then there's a section that's specific to data aggregators as well. So these third parties in requesting this, this data might work with a data aggregator. And when that data aggregator is requesting information, there's specific requirements that apply to that data aggregator. There's a requirements for record retention. So that needs to be incorporated into policies as well to ensure compliance with the rule. So again, the requirements uh, for data providers and then requirements for third parties. But to circle back that fundamental aspect that applies to covered consumer financial products or services. And so the rule, um, as I had mentioned, defines this, this consumer financial products or services as a consumer account that's defined by Reg E, uh, a credit card as defined by Reg Z, and facilitation of payments between a Reg E account and a Reg Z credit card. So again, to kind of put this into a summary, into that nutshell, what we have is the fundamental aspect of the rule on the slide. And in large part, what you see here is taken directly from the rule. Uh, the idea being that CFPB is um, implementing this so that consumers who have transaction accounts, so think again about that coverage on the last side, that's going to be checking, credit cards, uh, so forth. Those consumers who have those accounts need to have access to their personal financial data so that then they can decide to share or transfer it to another party under those third party provisions that we mentioned. The cover data then being that transaction history, the balance, and everything that encompasses the account's financial picture, um, which CFPB is characterized as a life ledger. So that's a concept that uh, uh, Director Chopra has discussed in the release that was put out alongside this rule. So I know many of you have likely read that and, and getting the concept of the rule, but the idea being that the consumer has at right uh, to make it easier to explore other products. Um, instead of maybe getting an incomplete picture, depending on what might be made available currently, um, or maybe not even having access to that information at all, um, which then in turn, um, the concern would be that the consumer has a harder time obtaining those financial products or services that they're looking for. Lastly, then we have compliance dates. So the last bullet point of this slide, um, these are of course going to range based on the issuance of the final rule. Again, this being a proposal, but when CFPB does look to finalize rule after receiving those comments, depending on that date, ranging from six months after the final rule to four years after the final rule, depending on asset size. Um, so again, 500 billion in total assets being six months afterward, 50 billion to that 500 billion then in that window of one year, and then 850 million to 50 billion two and a half years. And then anyone less than 850 million in total assets would have an implementation period of four years after issuance of the final rule. Um, so again, another proposal uh, to look at, uh, another fun read, uh, but for this one, we do have that working group. So if this is an issue that you're interested in participating on those comment on that advocacy efforts on, uh, please reach out to us at WBA Legal. Shifting gears, as Heather had mentioned, uh, we do want to make you aware of two alerts issued by FinCEN. And as in the past, we always like to point these out. Um, there's a link to them to learn more uh, in the description of the video below. Uh, but the first one is to assist in identifying suspicious activity, which might be related to financing of terrorist activity. And so as with FinCEN's previous alerts, it describes the type of activity that they're targeting here, including red flags to potentially identify it, uh, and then filing instructions from the SAR, so the fields and the narrative. The next one um, is, is a bit more unique, um, but you know, given the creativity and, and the willingness of fraudsters and bad actors to jump on anything, um, we have uh, fraudsters pretending to be FinCEN. And with new beneficial ownership information reporting requirements coming up uh, early next year, the fraudsters are now uh, mimicking uh, FinCEN, uh, reaching out regarding this rule 
and pretending to request information or, or pretending to uh, induce the customer to click on something or scan a QR code, um, which again is really no different than any other phishing attempt that we've seen. The key here being though, that we know from many of you, and as we've talked about in our past compliance corner videos just last month, in fact, um, some of your customers have questions about this. Um, being those entities, being those businesses that are gonna be subject to these new reporting requirements, wondering what they need to do, wondering where they can get more information. And so, of course, that's ripe for potential fraudsters to send out and say, hey, here's where you can get more information. That request, of course, not being legitimate. So take a look at this. Uh, if you are one who do, does have those customers who do have those business base um, that are going to have questions um, so that you're aware and could potentially uh, spread and share this information with those customers um, so that they know that FinCEN is not going to reach out like this. So they need to watch out for that. Um, if they do want information, as we talked about in last month's video, FinCEN has a great website, has FAQ, has video resources, um, other materials that reporting entities can use to learn more. Um, but again, just to, to reiterate, those emails um, are not FinCEN. Those are going to be fraudsters, the bad actors, and phishing attempts. All right, so with that, I will turn it back over to Heather to look at a couple CFPB items, among others. Super, thank you, Scott. And yes, there are two items that we wanted to make sure were on your radar that were issued earlier this month. Uh, the first being a joint statement by the CFPB and the Department of Justice regarding fair lending and credit opportunities for non-citizens. Um, so they issued the letter saying that they wanted to make sure that lenders understood the implications of just outright denying of individuals based upon an immigration status. Now, having said that, ECOA, it's very clear in ECOA, in Regulation B in particular, that there's not an express prohibition that a bank cannot consider the immigration status, meaning that you can, if in fact you're looking at that status when trying to determine the ability for repayment and the risk to the bank for repayment. So that's an important consideration that you wanna um, be mindful of when you're reading through that guidance. Um, make sure that you are not having overly broad um, procedures looking at someone's immigration status. Uh, but again, ECOA allows you to look at that status. Just make sure that you're denying loans or approving loans based upon what you can uh, appropriately underneath Reg B. The other item to be aware of is the supervisory highlights as it relates to junk fees. This is an updated item, first released in March of 2023, updated here then in this month. They take a look at, once again, deposits. Um, as you can uh, anticipate, representment items are discussed in there, overdraft items are discussed in there, uh, the return deposit fee charge is discussed in there, as well as some uh, loan servicing on the auto on the automobile loan side of life. But what we want you to make sure that you key in on is read through that deposit section, make sure you're reviewing your own fee schedule and your disclosure schedule to make sure that what's being charged customers is in fact uh, very carefully disclosed. You know, many of us have been dealing with this now for almost two years as the regulators kind of work through each different fee. So double check your fees, work with your core providers, understand um, how those fees are being uh, charged and to be aware of those particular fees highlighted in this guidance um, specifically. So um, with that, we'll go to the next slide, just kind of piggybacking on the junk fee slide, that being the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve has issued a consumer compliance outlook in early October talking about representment fees, representment fees being one of those junk fees that were identified in the CFPB's highlights that I just mentioned. So what's the... Fed is doing is very similar to what has occurred with OCC and what has occurred with FDIC about 18 months ago, where they're being very critical on representment fees and the charge. They're citing it as being an unfair charge underneath the Federal Trade Commission Act, Section 5, which is UDAP. And the bullets that we have here on the slide are the components that make up the unfair component within the act itself, saying that it's causing substantial injury to the customer, that being monetary harm. 
that the customer is not able to avoid that because it's the merchant that's sending through the represented item and that the fees are being retained by the bank. There's no benefit to the consumer because of that charge and that benefit. Um, there's nothing in competition that is outweighing that harm. So looking at all those different unfairness factors, I do think that we can expect regulators to really scrutinize fees that we've disclosed and are charging. So we want to make sure that we are being very much upfront, explaining what our cores can and cannot do, um, explaining how fees are charged or not charged, explaining how a customer can avoid those fees, um, et cetera, to be really quite prepared to explain um, fees in general, but with the Federal Reserve, this representment fee. Um, we're hearing different stories from different um, bankers. So I do think it's going to be fact specific to each of your own institutions, which was true with the FDIC. Um, and we are currently working with the Federal Reserve to put some more clarity around uh, this particular topic understanding whether or not it's going to be retrospective or prospective. So we'll have more information as that comes forward. Uh, for those of you who are going to be at the upcoming WBA Compliance Forum, which is going to be in early November, I, uh, we have a regulator panel with the OCC, the Federal Reserve, and FDIC. I think you can expect in that discussion and in our questions on behalf of the members who are going to be attending, you'll see topics such as the representment fee topic presented, junk fee fees in general, the, su the supervisory highlight guidance I just mentioned, and the immigration piece that was issued by the CFP. All of those things I think we're going to be talking about in that session. Uh, so stay tuned for more on that. Scott, what else do you have? A couple more things. So we did want to make you aware of a couple consumer resources um, for your own information, but also to potentially share with your customers uh, should be relevant. And the first one is that FTC put out a notice that the consumer reporting agencies have decided to permanently make available the free credit checks, um, which is essentially a continuation of what we saw starting with the pandemic. Um, so that's really all there is to it. Um, that announcement from the CRAs and the link that we have is to FTC uh, covering that announcement. But of course, within that, uh, customers should be aware that non-affiliated offers uh, might be fraudulent as well. So to understand um, that as with what we've talked before and with other aspects, there, there are bad actors out there uh, looking to gather information um, from customers, but the CRAs through their appropriate channels are making those credit checks available. And on the topic uh, of deposit insurance, FDIC has launched a campaign to raise awareness about deposit insurance. So of course, there are some other good resources out there, and we've talked about those before, and I'm sure many of you are aware of them, that FDIC has FAQs, there's information pages about what deposit insurance is, about what the categories are. There's, of course, the ED calculator to use um, to, to be able to see a customer to see what deposits are insured, uh, the FDIC hotline. But this is a separate campaign, um, again, to raise that awareness. And so understand the risk, um, really kind of consumer facing and, and just making, making that uh, information available that, deposit, that deposits are insured through the FDIC and so as part of that, there are resources and toolkits designed to promote that awareness. So again, know that customers um, earlier this year had a lot of questions regarding deposit insurance or just insurance in general and maybe didn't know. And so a lot of this has kind of come out of that and an effort to make sure that customers do know. And once they know, can understand how that insurance applies to them. So with that, I'd like to wrap up with a happy, spooky little October slide here and just remind everyone of the resources that are available on the WBA website. So, of course, compliance tools and resources, publications such as Compliance Journal, uh, training opportunities, the Compliance Hotline where you can call in, email in, uh, and the WBA Legal In-House Compliance Training. So if that's something that you'd be interested in for training opportunities, uh, myself and Heather to either come in and in person or provide virtual training, that is now something that we're offering as well. Um, and to jump off of the FDIC deposit insurance, there's consumer-facing resources as well, including 
uh, one pagers that we've created um, to be able to share with your customers as well. Um, so again, given everything um, that consumers might be having questions about what's going on, make sure to take advantage of those resources. So with that, we will wrap up this month. Thank you for joining us and we will see you again next month.